Mr. Beat is still wrong about the Electoral College, and today we are going to finish that debate. Stay tuned. What's up guys, Vince Dow here. So in the last video, we responded to the first half of Mr. Beat's video titled, The Electoral College Still Sucks. This is obviously part two. So if you have not watched part one, go watch it. I'm putting the card on the screen and the link in the description. But as a quick recap, Professor Libtard basically made some fairly generic arguments in favor of a national popular vote. I explained why I don't believe in majoritarianism and why the nature of our republic as a union of states, right? We are the United States justifies the state-based election of the federal executive, which is the electoral college. Again, watch part one if you want those full explanations. Today, we're going to finish the second half of his video, but before we do, I want to address something I said last time because I had a bunch of nerds trying to debunk me over this. So earlier, Mr. Beat claimed that we are more informed than the Founding Fathers, and here was my response. But the Founding Fathers didn't have access to the same information we do today. No offense to the Founding Fathers, but you watching this video right now are likely much more informed than they ever were. I actually don't believe I'm as smart or as exceptional as the founders were, nor are you, nor are most of the high school students who are assigned to watch your videos. So a bunch of people came back saying, actually, Vince, he didn't say we were smarter. He said we were more informed. Okay, firstly, he clearly equated the ability of being informed with the ability to make good decisions and write a constitution, which was my point. Okay, but fine, if you want to split hairs, I will admit I wrote the script based on memory and notes of his video, so I guess I got the exact words wrong there, even though the point still stands. But if you want to take the more informed line 100% literally, I have news for you. You're still wrong. The average person today, especially the average high school kid who watches his videos, is not smarter or more informed than the Founding Fathers. They may have more access to information, it doesn't mean that they know more information. I guarantee you that Lakeisha from first period history class and part one of this video is far less literate and informed of world history than the Founding Fathers were. Sure, they didn't have Google, but the Founders were extensive students of philosophy, history, and the liberal arts. I venture to say they probably read way more books than you have, especially considering reading books was what people did in their free time back then, whereas now we just charge our phones and go on social media, right? The Founding Fathers were students of history. The Founding Fathers were more informed than most of today's populace. And I'd go so far as to say they could give a lot of modern academics a run for their money. I genuinely think Alexander Hamilton could completely own I don't know, Cornell West in a debate today. But regardless, that's not even the audience of Mr. Beat's video, who I know Alexander Hamilton would completely destroy. Regardless of however you want to interpret the more informed line that Mr. Beat said, he's still wrong. The founders could run circles around you in both knowledge and intellectual wit. So you did not own me, fans of Professor Libtard. He's still wrong. It's still a stupid argument. Okay, with that cleared up, let's get into the rest of the video. The best argument is that it prevents the possibility of having a nationwide recount, which would be a headache and allow for corruption easily. With basically 50 separate state elections, we only need recounts in at most one or two states. Ah, but you can still have 50 separate elections without the Electoral College. Federalism doesn't have to be put aside to reform how we elect the president and vice president. In fact, did you know that federal elections are already incredibly decentralized? Most states report election results at the precinct level, which is a small area in which all voters go to a single polling place to vote. Part of the reason why each state gets to control its own electoral system is the Constitution and the Electoral College. And I'd like to point out 
that liberals are also pushing to nationalize the practice of elections. Case in point, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which significantly increased the power of the federal Department of Justice to exert control over the statewide practices of elections. And H.R. 1, which is a radical bill that already passed the House, by the way, implements automatic and same-day voter registration, limits removing voters from voter rolls, and requires states to establish certain commissions to run their redistricting processes. Again, this is the federal government mandating how states run their elections. Mr. Beat, do you support H.R. 1? You probably do because you're a raging libtard, but don't pretend as if the same people who are trying to abolish the Electoral College aren't also trying to federalize elections because they are. And let's not pretend that Democrats wouldn't, at the very least, significantly decrease state control of the election process if they succeeded in abolishing the Electoral College because, folks, they already are. Spoken like a true socialist. Democracy appears nowhere in the Constitution. Communists chose not to read it like yourself. So true, King, so true. So what? The word privacy isn't in the Constitution. There's nothing about political parties in there. Nothing about contraceptives or abortion. Nothing about corporations or labor unions. So much of what we get out of the Constitution these days is implied. Okay, but the Electoral College is in the Constitution. You're advocating for changing that. I'm not sure why we keep having this silly semantic argument over the Constitution and what it says and what it doesn't when you were advocating for changing the U.S. Constitution already. And what does this have to do with the Electoral College debate? I, I, I don't know. It protects the minority states from majority states. Imagine living in Kansas State and there is a vote that New York and Kansas had to vote on a law that would change your lifestyle if you're... Kansas, you're screwed. That username though. Anyway, no, with a popular vote, every vote is equal. Also, every person in one state doesn't vote the same way. And if anything, borders are becoming increasingly meaningless when it comes to cultural differences. The federal government is not supposed to govern individuals. States are supposed to govern as individual nations. The federal government is supposed to govern between states. The only reason that people think this whole argument makes sense is because the federal government has its slimy tentacles in way too many areas of individual life. Yeah, it's a good argument, although it still feels a bit post hoc. Then again, this comment seems to be from someone stuck in 1787, as many electoral college defenders often apparently are. Uh, can someone send these guys a time machine? We ought to look at the electoral college through the lens of 2022. Again, I just don't understand how he can say, oh, we still have the constitution in one breath and then call it outdated in another breath. It's just strange. I don't know. It's not the 1780s anymore, okay? Now, at the root of my argument against the Electoral College is that the, the president, president ought not, not represent, represent the states, states but, but the, the people. people. The presidency, well, the executive branch as a whole, has rapidly become nationalized since the founding of the Republic. The federal government has tremendous influence over our lives and greatly supersedes state power. So that's where we fundamentally disagree. Sure, states' power is smaller today. Sure, the federal government is larger today. But we are still fundamentally a republic of states. As I brought up in the last video, states' power, even today, is still much stronger than the provinces or states of any other country I can think of. And what's more, states' power still supersedes federal power in its ability to impact your life. Does the politics of your state or your federal government impact you more? Well, let's put that to the test. I grew up in California, okay? So I experienced California with both Trump and Biden as president. Last year, I moved to Florida while Biden was still president. And I can tell you personally, my life was a lot more different moving to a state with a different governor than it was living in the same state under different presidents. That's a mouthful, but my point is that state politics 
still impacts your life more than federal politics. My point is that states' identity and our federal nature of the republic is still strong and still relevant even today. What I will also point out is that I think the centralized nature of political power in America is only going to decline over the next few decades. I actually think we're going to get a return to more state control because of how divided our politics are. You're starting to see the shells of that already form, right? What did blue states do when Trump was president? They defied him. What do red states do to Biden? They kind of defy him. I wish they would do more honestly, but sort of, kind of, right? The point is, we very obviously see that federal power is going to decrease in the coming years, meaning that the Electoral College and our Republic of States, not a Republic of People, a Republic of States, is bound to grow more relevant in the coming years, not less. Sure, this wasn't always the case, but over time, especially over the past 100 years, the federal government has had more and more of an active role in the lives of Americans, and the courts have mostly been okay with such an increase of federal power. Now, you can disagree with that, fine, but you need to accept the reality which we're living in. You need to accept the reality that we are living in, which is that your federal system is actually beginning to crumble. and. What kind of argument even is this? Oh, I'm sorry my liberal presidents like FDR and LBJ completely destroyed the republic, so instead of trying to restore it, you need to just submit to my will to change the constitution itself. No. Screw you, dude. <laughs> Not only that, states depend heavily on the federal government these days. For example, West Virginia gets 45% of its revenue from federal sources. Yeah, it'd be screwed without the federal government. Isn't that a case for the Electoral College? <laughs> I mean, like what? What is the Electoral College? The Electoral College is states deciding the president. If the politics of the federal government has a heavy impact on states, and as you describe, a heavier impact than they used to have, would that not strengthen the case for the Electoral College? If the state of West Virginia takes half of its funding from the federal government, then the state of West Virginia clearly has a vested interest in choosing the president. Like, am I the crazy one here, or is he not making any sense? Because in one breath, he says states don't matter anymore. In another breath, he points out how federal politics are more relevant to the states now than they used to be. Which one is it, dude? Isn't the entire argument of electoral college defenders that small states would get left behind by a popular vote like West Virginia? If the cooperative relationship of the states with the federal government has grown stronger since 1787, does that not strengthen the case for the Electoral College? Does it not strengthen the case for states having a voice in our federal politics because federal politics affects the states now more than it used to? I don't know. Do, do I just not get it? Am I the one who's like crazy here? Because that seems like a self-defeating argument to me, dude. And yeah, I know the founders generally wanted the states to elect the president, not the people directly. I know, okay? I teach this for a living. But uh, that can change. We can change that. Or it can stay the same. I was a bit surprised at how many electoral college defenders loved the fact that every vote was not counted equally. Correct. Yes, that's correct. First of all, Florida has more people than New York. Second, I still think everyone deserves to have their voice heard equally. If you are for the Electoral College, you're okay with some people's voices being louder than others. You're okay with inequality. Again, that's correct. Watch part one for my case against majoritarianism. But we also should not pretend like the method for representation in the Electoral College is completely arbitrary. Mr. Beat, in this video, you implied that you still support the way our Congress is elected, 
just not the president. And representatives would still make major decisions. It's an indirect democracy. I just think we should vote for president, you know, the same way we vote for literally every other public office in this country. You claim that the dude who implied that you might want to change the way the Senate was elected was committing a fallacy. Well, how is Congress elected? House seats are made proportional to the populations of states, but every state only gets two senators regardless of their size. So yes, representation in the U.S. Senate is unequal based on population. Wyoming gets the same federal representation in the Senate as California, despite being way smaller. Which means when it comes to determining policy in the U.S. Senate, people in Wyoming technically have a stronger voice based on population than people in California. You claimed you were okay with that. You said that in this video. So that means that you too are okay with parts of the federal government being based on unequal representation. That means you too are okay with the premise of the Connecticut Compromise, which said that we should strike a balance between representation of population size and representation of individual states. Hence, Congress was born. Hence, the Electoral College was born. Now, with that said, how is the Electoral College structured? The number of electors that each state gets is simply the sum of their number of house reps, which again, proportional to their population, plus their two senators, which is equal across all states, right? So if a state gets three electoral points, that's because they get their two senators and it's a small state, so they only have one congressman. In other words, it's a perfect balance between proportional representation of people and equal representation of states. In other words, it is a mirror image of how our Congress is structured. It is a mirror image of the Connecticut Compromise, which you claim that you still support. So what exactly is the big issue with the Electoral College? It's literally just a balance of how we decide the distribution of power in the House and the Senate. In conclusion, if the Electoral College is so good, why is it that not one other country in the entire world has implemented it like we do? We pointed this out in the last video, but again, not only is that because no other nation has a degree of state's identity that we do, but also that is an appeal to majority fallacy bandwagon fallacy appeal to popularity it has different names but mr beat spent much of the first half of this video being a nerd about all the logical fallacies that his opponents were committing when he himself is using the fact that other countries don't do this as an argument hey mr beat you claim to be a teacher you claim to know all about the fallacies here so let me teach you something right just because a bunch of other people do something or say something doesn't mean it is correct. It's pretty telling though, isn't it? He doesn't like the appeal to authority fallacy, aka using smart people to prove yourself correct. But he does like the appeal to majority fallacy, aka using majorities or popularity to prove yourself correct. Typical democracy supporter, okay? Just saying. Yeah, electoral college defenders actually like democracy. They think it's great. Uh, no, I do not, actually. They are having their voices heard right now. Look at them type away, bless their hearts. So those talking points again, eh? Haven't heard that one before. Our constitutional republic should favor the majority of us. Minority rule really is horrible. Why is it so horrible? Majority or minority rule is not good or bad. Morally correct rule is good. You can have minority rule that makes an awesome functioning society, and you can have majority rule that creates a terrible society, and vice versa, by the way. Again, moral correctness is not dictated by how many people do or don't support something. It is only the moral relativist who would think such a thing. Just saying. I've heard your arguments to keep the Electoral College for four years now, but every single one of your arguments is, and no offense, 
so weak and predictable that they're kind of boring at this point. It's not that I don't understand how presidential elections were supposed to go, I do. It's that how they were supposed to go sucks and it needs to change. Again, no, this doesn't mean I want a direct democracy. I want a true representative democracy. So I'll acknowledge that some of the normal arguments for the electoral college are kind of weak, right? But republic, not democracy. Well, when you say that, Mr. Beat can easily point out that, hey, I want a representative democracy or whatever. I don't, I don't want a direct democracy. You can still technically say that a national popular vote is still Republican in nature because it's choosing a representative, not a referendum, right? So like, I understand that, and, and that's why I didn't really use that argument a whole lot. But I think the arguments that we made over the course of these past two videos are fairly strong and not just the summation of things that you've heard over and over again. But I shouldn't be the judge of that, nor should he. You can be the judge of that, so let us know. That said, over the years, I have become less rigid on my opinions about the Electoral College, mostly from hearing from Electoral College defenders. And so I am willing to compromise. At the very least, I want every state to divide up their electoral votes by districts, just like Maine and Nebraska does. Can we at least get that? But then again, it's more fun to complain about things than to actually find a solution. Well, I just offered a solution, but additionally, I think we should implement either star voting or ranked choice voting on top of that. Yeah, ranked choice voting is stupid. People are too stupid to understand ranked choice voting, and so is the idea of doing it by district, but this video is going on long enough, so maybe we can talk about those some other time. But yeah, folks, that wraps up his video, and so that'll wrap up my video as well. So with that said, thank watching. I'm glad you guys like this two-part series. Look, the last thing I will say is just point out the very obvious fact that I have not pointed out yet, but it's the elephant in the room, which is that the reason liberals like him want to abolish the electoral college is because it'll help them in elections. Everyone knows this, okay? To that I say I honestly can't blame them because they play to win. Hey, say what you will about them, but liberals play to win. I just wish conservatives would have half as much firepower in defending the institutions that protect their power and their own voice. But, you know, what do I know? Anyways, guys, again, be sure to like and subscribe if you are new. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Alpha moves only. God bless. Peace.